Okay, who's got a question? Who'd like to throw something over? Anything, anything. Yes? <laughs> I'm wondering the importance of having a question Um, students to learn about the importance of children and learning. Is that anyone in particular? Anyone? Yeah. Anyone to have a crack at that? So. Yeah, I probably should. Look, it is a concern. I can only speak from the early childhood sector and the training there, but um, we're not seeing as much recognition of early childhood within our training programs as what there should be. I know I certainly do a lot in RMIT, and in fact, Leanne is here. I'm um, now working at the Botanic Gardens and we then went through RMIT. So every year there's half a dozen of students that get really switched on to outdoor play and nature and follow it through. Um, the other thing that we've done at RMIT is that Barbara Chancellor that I work with, she's developed a unit around play and outdoor play and that's available to students doing Bachelor of Education. It's also available across the campus to perhaps students that are doing landscape architecture. Um, and that's another area, um, someone else from Play Australia, Felix, is working with Monash University in their landscape arch architecture course, trying to get a unit on play as part of a landscape architecture course so that they're more aware of the play needs of children. Um, um, look, at it, there needs to be a lot more, I'm, I'm right with you on that Kirsty, there needs to be a lot more, um, and anecdotally I've heard from students in other universities uh, when I've done a workshop on outdoor play, they say, we didn't cover any of this in our training course. So it's certainly an area that we need to do more. Anybody else have a comment on that? Mm -hmm. um, tertiary visitation has been one of our biggest growth um, groups here at the Gardens, and so I'm imagining that they are looking for places to come and to, to show their students, education students in particular I'm talking about, um, both early childhood and primary education students. Um, so the lecturers seem to be looking for um, ideas for what to do with playgrounds, um, how to make playgrounds sustainable and full of biodiversity and fun and to be engaging with children. Um, but they, they're also looking for ways to connect those things to the curriculum, which is really exciting too. So that if you, your passion is literature, you can take children outdoors through the literature, or if you're passionate for maths, you can do that. Um, so we really love working with teacher students because um, we know, we hope and we think that they'll bring kids back here, but there really does seem to be a growing interest for us here. Um, and we will probably see about a thousand teacher students a year come on excursions. So we're hopeful that things are changing. We're, we've had a very strong partnership with Sue for a long time, which has really enhanced the way that we um, uh, um, well, we apply um, latest pedagogical thinking to what we do, which is really valuable. Um, but also to hear what the students' needs are at that level is really valuable. And we're looking at another um, partnership at the moment with Deakin University. And the idea is that they'll set up a um, subject early childhood outdoor um, spaces. And part of it will be run here at Gardens outdoors and part of it will be on site at the university. So we'll be like a partner in delivering that, that content. So that's, that's a bit of a new thing for us. Any other comments from the panel? Any other next question? I just hang on. Is there another question? Another thought? Uh, yeah, over here. Thank you, You know, some of the radio stations actually move around um, and they'll broadcast on their radio station 
Uh, we're here for free giveaways down at the Frankston Four Shore. If you're here in the next hour and a half, you can win um, this, 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 and this. So maybe Ranger Roo could be roving into all the different parks and. Um, online, the kids can work out where he's going to be and where they can catch up with him and, um, you know, yeah, just a thought. Yeah. So then you get them off their technology and out into nature. I think the pest of power also comes from the positive experiences that children do have. Um, if, for example, they've been on an excursion to the Botanic Gardens, then they're more likely to go home and then ask their parents to take them to the Botanic Gardens again or what we're already beginning to notice with the bush kinder in Darren Parklands is that children are saying that they want to go to the Darren Parklands at other times when it's not the bush kinder program. So it's those positive experiences that children have saying, I want to go here again, I want to go here again, that then create the pest of power. The other thing I might throw in, just, just a, a side issue to that, is that um, about in the States, I think half the psychology graduates today are working in advertising. So they learn about early childhood development and then they sell their knowledge to advertisers to say, here's how the kids want things. It's been going for some time. Here's, that's the bad news, here's the good news. Advertising agencies become very vain at how clever they are in manipulating kids. And then they're dumb enough to publish books and say, this is how we do it. So what happens is next time you go to a large book shop, look at the sort of sales, marketing, you know, propaganda mind control sections of it. And books that you would not, you just wouldn't be seeing dead reading, read them. There's a great one called Why We Buy, and it's basically the, the cutting edge anthropology on how we just all become mindless consumers. And of course you can reverse it and how, you know, push the button a different way and get a different behaviour. So sometimes it's worth learning from advertisers because they've figured this stuff out. They're just using the evil not to do this. Any other comments before we get to another question? Any other questions? Yeah. Can I just make a comment? Um, I think we have to be very careful with um, people in our councils um, that they don't uh, confront a group of adults and children perhaps at the beach and say, do you have a permit for building a second castle? What do you think about that? That is a true happening. Oh, that's how you have it. With Norell's group. <laughs> yeah. Yes, can I just add to that? Um, it's interesting the feedback that we've had just to um, illustrate to you how foreign it is for children, for people to see children playing in nature now. When we were down at um, Sweetwater Creek, there's a beautiful little place there called the Granites, and there's slow moving water, and it's easy for children that are learning to walk to negotiate a river crossing. So we're down there playing. And um, one serial complainer went to the council and, and phoned and said, I'd like to report some cult activity down at Sweetwater Creek. <laughs> cult, religious cult activity. <laughs> because that's how foreign it is to see people together celebrating and experiencing nature. They weren't singing chants or anything, they were just doing river crossings holding the children. So holding the children's hands and then letting them experience it on their own once they became great. So that's how foreign it is in nature for, for you know, people are suspicious. So and um, yeah, this, that was a story to come from our program. That you know, just playing in nature, we were asked for permits to be down there building sandcastles. And um, also illustrating, you know, children drawing on the footpath of chalk. You know, it's um, been frowned upon and called graffiti wow. by some councils, so that's a, a very valid point, Cathy. Yeah. Any other comments? From... Actually, we, we're very lucky. My wife and my family and I, we live in this lovely little house which we got really cheaply in a great area. And I, I thought there must have been something wrong with it. And the estate agent said, yeah, the problem is there's a primary school next door and a lot of people don't like the sounds of children laughing. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Just like, are you sure? Because I work from home and I can hear them laughing and screaming and yeah. running around. It's like music to me. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. How, how crusty do you have to get to not like that? <laughs> <laughs> any, other, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Sophie, tell us about the bush kinder. Is it a bush that's the space that they go to or is it actually their um, The West Coast Kindergarten Bush Kinder 
It's a, a space within Darabin Parklands. Darabin Parklands is quite big, runs the whole length of the uh, Darabin Creek. So there's a particular area that they've chosen, and they've chosen it for a number of reasons, um, particularly around risk management, because there's an area in Darabin Parklands in Alfington that's away from the main water areas within the parkland, so that was important for setting up the Bush Kinder. And also it has some geographical landscape markers, such as a, a natural sort of amphitheatre and some uh, trees of interesting shapes that have defined the boundaries. So the teacher there has used storytelling, uh, linking those geographical landmarks to create the boundaries. And it's only been a matter of weeks and the children are able to, um, they're well able to define those boundaries to take new people around those boundaries. So is it an excursion or is it... Uh, is in terms of the department area? approval, it's considered to be a regular excursion. Um, it runs, at the moment they're only trialling it, so it's with um, one four-year-old group of children and that group is split into two smaller groups. So they have a group of about 14 children that come for three hours in the morning and another group that come in the afternoon. And that's with two teachers. So, which is, you would understand is quite expensive, but there's such as the commitment in that particular community, and they certainly make cost savings in other directions so that they've been able to run this pilot. Um, they have received some funding and some sponsorship from uh, particular organisations that's been very useful. Any other comments from the panel? Mm -hmm. Any other questions, thoughts? Yes, it's like um, Sue, is that? In all weathers, that Bushkinder? Yeah, Bushkinder operates in all weathers um, and they do have certainly a risk management plan if there's going to be lightning or hard before so that they all know about what the weather is likely to be. In fact, on the second week that they ran the Bushkinder, it began to rain. And of course, the immediate reaction was to shelter under a tree when it was raining. But um, not long after doing that, the park ranger came along and she was out planting trees in the rain. It's a good time to plant. The children saw her planting trees in the rain and decided, well, we've got our raincoats on, why can't we play in the rain? So they were out there playing in the rain. There is a shelter that they can go to if necessary. It's about a five minute walk from where the bush kinder is. And I should mention the other thing about having a defined space. That's the experience overseas it's important to have a defined space. It's not a matter of going to a park and letting children run loose right through acres and acres of bushland. You have a defined space that children come to know and identify with, and that's how the forest preschools operate overseas. So you become very familiar. A sense of ownership and identity with that particular space is important. I'd like to ask a question. I know you're vaguely familiar with each other's work, but having heard the four presentations this morning, is there anything that you take away or connections that you see that, that you might have known before this morning, having seen each other's presentations? <laughs> <laughs> a lovely chance to share our um, skills with everyone and knowledge and, and to meet you all and, and make connections. Uh, we've all kind of heard of each other and met each other at different functions, but it's lovely to collaborate here yeah, together. Chris, you have something? I was just going to say how extraordinary it is that things are going on all around us that we don't necessarily know that are going on. We might have a little inkling, but you know, not to really tap into the to the true worth and the true um, experience. And so um, that's sort of sad in a way. But it's, yeah, it, it, but it's great then that we can have these sort of functions and so that we can share these things. It's one of the things we find with networks when you bring people together. Every single one of them thinks that they're the only one who cares and the only one who's trying. And then suddenly you get into a room full of people who say, oh my God, there's more of us. Why don't we work together more often? Mm -hmm. Did you have something? Yeah, just following on to that, I think it's probably not only four of us, probably there's lots of experience in the, in the room as well. And we're, we're working on projects across, across the state, perhaps, um, that we can tap into as well. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts or questions? Yeah. Um, I work for Berry Creek Management Committee um, and I've got about 10 years or 11 years experience now working with kids aged from preschool.